Okay. Oh, it's a one. Um, did you get my email? I did get your email. Uh, Excellent. I just wanted to know one more thing. Since you are going to be away on Wednesday next week. No. Yes, I am, but someone else is teaching that. Okay, so, and slides for that. I'll, I'll send you the slides. Okay. Cool. I shall. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm actually sharing my entire screen because it doesn't look like I am. Usually I see kind of recursive, but maybe this is fine. Um, you will now enter Google Hangout. I know, I thought I am in the, okay, fine. I'm in the Google Hangout. Right, okay, as I was saying, I wanted to get a nice image for IFS to show you today, but uh, I couldn't find one. I'm sure they exist. But uh, maybe I was just being a little too naive. So um, let's just see if uh, Dropbox is still updating what I did find. And then we'll start our um, real work for today. I just want to find what I put up last night. Um, and if I can't find it, I'll just search for it again. Teaching this year and percent one. Does it have model? Okay, it's all going to download an image, so that's fine. Let's just give it a while. I'll maybe I'll Google for it. Um, iterated fractal function system example um, compression. Okay. Images. I'll just find it again. It's e easy to find. I say, I say, but uh, maybe I don't find it. So as you can see, there's lots of stuff about this image fractal, iterated fractal systems on the web. Um, I just want to find the interesting stuff. I mean, all of it is interesting, but this is the image I really wanted to show you. So um, I am not going to show you a tracking system with high effects like this. We will get to it soon, but I'm not going to show you the one that will generate this little picture. Um, there may be one, uh, but it's a little more complicated than just entering a matrix and getting out this beautiful picture. Um, in particular, what they do is they um, use IFS for image compression, not image generation. And the way they do that is to find pieces of the image that are self-similar. Um, for example, if you look at this fence, there's a lot of similarity going on in the fence. There's lots of little pieces. We just take a small little block out of this fence. We can match it in different places in the image. And that's basically how IFS works in real life. That um, instead of having a point, if you transform it in another place, you have a frequency triangle, we took a point and then we randomly chose another corner of the triangle and uh, part of the halfway point. Um, instead of taking just a point that we transformed to some other space, we actually take a little block of the image, a little square. Let's say a piece of fence. And you have a matrix and you transform that one little piece to be somewhere else. And you keep on doing that. And so you can fill in pieces of the image like that. And then you actually have the second IFS, the second interactive function system, that you use again, let's say, the grass, and you apply that many, many times, and you fill in the grass. So you, in this way, covered the whole image. This is a good image because this brick wall is very self similar. Lots of pieces that are small pieces that are similar. The clouds are self similar. The grass is very similar to each other. This fence, this wooden wall. And the amazing thing about IFS is that if you use this image compression, you can do things that you can't do with other techniques. For example, we've all seen CSI, where we have CCTV camera image of a uh, CCTV image of a criminal doing some horrible thing. And then they zoom in, and instead of it being pixelated, it starts with this, and then the computers miraculously resolve it, and it comes out perfectly clear again like this. And they can zoom in infinitely much. Now, you can't do that with um, most systems because they use compression techniques 
that do go to a certain level of granularity. They go to this level of pixels. But if you use IFS, you can, in some sense, go in infinitely often. Because that's how you created the image. You said, well, this image looks very diverse, but actually, if you take this piece of cloud and you transform it in a certain way, you get a different part of the image. And if you carry on doing that, you can go finer and finer and finer. So that if you have iterated function systems, you can actually go in very deep. You zoom in very deeply in the system. So this was a normal image compression. And most of the images we use on the internet, even this image itself, they're all compressed using this kind of pixelated techniques. But if you use IFS, then you can get finer detail. It's because you do more work to compress it. It's much, much slower than the techniques we know. But you can use it um, to do the, to this kind of thing. Um, here they use some other technique called cubic B spline, which I won't explain, but it kind of approximates the image technique. This is what they'd use if they wanted to make this smoother. And yeah, it's beautiful, but it has a limitation as well. You can't go much finer than this because there's information in the original image that is not that is lost when you pixelate it. So this is really, this one, is just a smoother version of this image. And then here it says, our method. Now this image, this whole picture, comes from um, some paper that they published. Um, can I find the paper? In this journal, DSHIEEE. Not exactly sure what that is. So uh, they propose some new technique where they can actually zoom in even further. I don't know how it works at all. I don't know if it's IFS or some other technique. I honestly have no idea. Um, let's just find, let's just see if I can find one more little illustration just on this Google page. I didn't look for it before, but um, I suspect somewhere in here they'll have an illustration of how IFS really works. Image compression. Um, this isn't it, but well, it's not going to help us. Let's just find this classical image. Um, no. Just give me a second. I'll find it. Um, let's hope I don't find anything bad. OK, I'm clearly not going to find it now. But if you wanted to um, compress an image in a given image, you take, this is a classical image that people use all the time. Uh, it's called LADA. Oh, here we go. The image. Let's make it a little bigger. So you take this kind of classical image and you say, I want to compress this using IFS. So the first step is to identify pieces of the image that appear more than once. That's called self-similarity. The image is similar to itself in some way. And as you can see there by your hat, I don't know if my pointy stick to that. Uh, on the top, on the left-hand side of her hat, there's a small block with a pattern in it. And it's kind of repeated here. Background. So this is a good candidate for saying, okay, let's take that block and calculate an IFS matrix for it, iterated function system matrix, that we can repeat. We find all instances, not just this one, but there are many other places. If we rotate it by uh, 3 degrees, 170 or so, it may even fit here, down by our shoulder. So, um, that's how IFS works in real life. People do use it, but it's not common. If you think of all the techniques you know for image, storing images, GIMP and PNG and JPEG, none of those use this kind of technique. At least not off the bat. OK. So this is IFS in real life. In real life, what am I talking about? In all, in all senses. Um, Let's see, of course, Eclipse is not started up. So I'm going to start up Eclipse. Um, if I can find it, Eclipse. 
And we are going to do a little bit of this article, a little more. So it will illustrate uh, what we're supposed to talk about on Friday, what we'll talk about today, which is unit testing. If you've written a big program, any kind of program, you need to check that it's correct. If you write a practical test, you take, check that check button at the bottom before you hand in. Um, it is in use or cannot be created. Please choose a different one. Oh, this is good because I think I misspelled the name. I put in exclamation mark. So maybe this is a good chance to fix the name and start again. I want to browse. Offer me a space in a second. So um, if you've written any program, you need to check that it's correct. That checking is vital in computer science, in programs. We call it uh, testing. Oh, see, I entirely, I don't know, I was just excited. So I put in Ervia exclamation one four, which is very, very wrong. So I'm going to take this opportunity to fix it, uh, if I can. I'll make a new folder. OK, please, please, computer, be faster. Um, it's a new folder, Arbia 1134 workspace. I'll call it that, and I'll open it. Yes, OK. And that's going to take me to the welcome screen because it's a new workspace, and that's fine. Um, as I was saying, we've written a program, we need to test that it's correct. How do we test it? Well, usually, even in industry, what people do is they run the program with many, many inputs and check manually that it behaves correctly. And that takes a very, very long time because you have to sit there and work through the program. Big companies have big teams called quality assurance teams of people that they employ to test the programs they write for themselves or even the programs other people write for them. Um, my sister works for Sunlam, and she's a tester like this. She, they get very large systems, they make their own very large systems, and then these systems have to be tested. And they have quality assurance teams that manage the testing of these systems. But often, it amounts to people sitting in front of the computer and just running the program over and over, and checking that works as it's supposed to work. That's at a very high level. That's the whole program. That's a big piece of software, like a whole of Eclipse. But we are not going to write the whole of Eclipse. Even this Eclipse, this IDE that we've been using, is written all in Java. But we are not going to write the entire Eclipse and then start checking if it's working. We want to check much, much earlier. So this big testing, of the whole system, often called uh, acceptance testing, or user testing, or integration testing sometimes. Um, that's something we do at the end of a product's, of a program software's lifespan. Much earlier than that, when we're working on Eclipse and writing one little class that'll be part of the Eclipse system, no, don't report anything, that's okay. Go to the workbench. New shiny works bench. Okay, I like to do a few things. I like to um, close that. I like to move my outline over here, and I like to open up a console. Uh, view console. Good, excellent. Um, when we write one class on some part of the class or part of any program. We, as the programmer, code monkey, not part of the quality assurance team, um, we need to test the one class that we've written ourselves. <coughs> Just that one class. And that activity is called unit testing. So we've written a class, we've written a couple of functions inside the class, and before we give it to other people so they can integrate it with the rest of the clips, we need to make sure that our one class is working. You will be doing the same thing. You write a new project, and uh, you write one class, and before you add it to the rest of your 
project, you want to make sure that that class is working correctly. So you need to test a, one, uh, um, you need to test every single function, each and every function, to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. We call that unit testing. It's an important activity, and I wish Eclipse were faster. But that's okay. It'll give me time to go steal the IFS code from the from the um, website, Princeton website. So, Princeton intro to CS. Yes, that's the one I want. And um, down here is the, some code, I'm sure. And there should be a long list. Where do you think is IFS? Chapter two. Are we in chapter two? Oh, IFS, oh, good. good. Iterated function systems, good. And let's just go directly to the source code. Oh, it's long. Oh, and they've got lots of examples. Oh, good. Exciting stuff. Oh, come on, Eclipse, are you waiting for me? Something uh, hanging. Okay. As soon as Eclipse responds, we'll, I'm going to enter that code. But let's have a look at it while we wait. So um, this is public class IFS. Now, they are using standard array IO, which reads whole arrays at a time. I mentioned it on Monday. I can actually show you how it works. It's pretty easy. There's one routine called read double I B. So read a one dimensional array of doubles and it expects the input to start with a number, an integer that says how many, how big the array should be, five entries, and then there should follow five doubles. So we can fit in the same code ourselves. You could have said read an integer, standard in dot next int, or read int, um, and then have a loop that reads the five doubles we want, but um, they've just packaged, packaged it for us. Um, this will be the name of the array, and it's an array of doubles. So that one line reads a double array from the same thing. Okay, so um, they've got this stuff, this is all in main. Uh, yeah, okay. Good. Um, I'll call my project IFS. Waiting for Eclipse. Error reporting. Disable. Close. Welcome to Eclipse. Do you want to help Eclipse? No? I don't. I want Eclipse to go away. Okay, never mind. Uh, okay, never mind that. Create a Java project. That's what I'm trying to do. If you let me, it's setting build paths. Maybe it's just because it's a new workflow. Never mind that. Um, so, IFS is a bit of an issue for me because I want to illustrate how you write your own class, write a lot of functions. And then you test the functions one by one. But they've done, what they've done is they've put all their code in one big function made. So all you can really do with IFS is run. And I'll do that in a second to make sure that it's working. Ah, oh, good. Actually, I want to make a second Java project, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. Um, so that we can wane. Is there any way I can get rid of this little, oh. There is. Good. Since we can wane, and all I want to do really is to put my standard library in here. Um, and I guess the way to do that is to say file import general um, just from the file system. Next. Browse. Good. Documents, old workspace, set we can wine library. Should be lying around here somewhere. I'm sorry my computer is so slow. Um, 
Oh, I can't just pick it. Oh, why can't I just? Uh, I need to a whole directory to. Oh, yeah. I, I take the whole directory. Yes, that's right. Good. And I just want that file. Good. So there it sits. And I can just close this and forget about it. And in here, I want to create a new class called IFS. Java created. I'm going to steal the code, select all, copy. Come to this side, select all, paste. Beautiful stuff. But it doesn't like standard IAD, all that stuff. Uh, so I know that I have to go and build path, configure build path, uh, libraries, add jar. Still not happy. Import a2 dot. It's going to be a long class. OK. Wow. Standard array. IO, good. Anything else you complain about Eclipse? Standard draw. Standard random, loads of stuff. Okay, so let's add those. So, anything else you want? No. Happy? Good. Um, this is going to read from the standard input. So, uh, it's going to wait for me to type stuff. Um, I don't really want to type the whole array into the console down here. So um, how am I going to do this? I have to figure out a way to <coughs> get this set. But let's first download just an example. Um, Sierpinski, we want that one. Copy, paste the URL. Is it fetching it? Waiting. Ah, oh, there we go. I could type this. I'll, I'll type this. Um, copy that and run IFS. It's creating the type hierarchy. I don't know what that is. It's running. I'm going to guess it's waiting for me to type stuff. So I'm going to type. Oh, no. <laughs> array out of bounds, bounds exception. Number of iterations. Okay. Okay, fine, fine. Jeez. Why is life so hard? Why is my life so hard? Run configurations. Arguments, dollar, string. Okay, how many iterations? How many times are you gonna take a point and transform it to another point? I don't know how many to say, but I'll just say 1,000. OK, and now I'm guessing it's waiting for me to type stuff here in the console, because the next thing it does is to read double. So I'll just go here again, copy, paste them all down here, enter. Are you drawing it? Oh, yes, something's happening. IFS, yes, good. Are you going to open a little screen? Come on. Come on, I know you want to. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it's not looking very happy. Is it waiting for more input? One. Oh, man. Oh. Okay. Okay, it just took a while. Just needed to warm up a little bit. But I could barely see the triangle. So it's probably my mistake as always. It's always Yaku that's to blame. Yaku's the bad one. So we'll just fix it. Run it again. It stopped running. Yes, it's not running. So run it again. This time a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand. 
waiting for my input. Here it is. Run. Run, beauty. Oh, you're running so slow. OK, a little faster. That's OK. I'm just closing the Eclipse window so we can see that it's not necessary. Um, so what my plan is in 20 minutes is to change IFS so that it becomes more of the kind of thing that we plan to write. A library that we might use as part of a bigger project. And what I'll do is I'll change the main function so that it does exactly what it's doing at the moment, except that it um, takes that command line argument as a parameter. It still reads from the standard input. Ooh, yeah, that looks much more like the seconds control. Okay. Don't know when it will stop. I know. Um, it takes a parameter. Um, the command line uh, parameter as a parameter of a function, and instead of actually drawing anything, because it's it's very difficult to test that it works correctly. How, how the hell do I know this program is working correctly? I can give it some big matrix like Stavinsky, and it looks like it's working, but maybe there is some subtle mistake. And I promise you, it's really easy to make subtle mistake. Maybe the next error I give it is broken. So I want to increase my confidence. So instead of actually drawing something on the screen and I have to check with my eyes, I'm going to ask it to not draw in on the screen, but to send back all the points it wants to plot. And then I'll draw the points. In that way, I've isolated the functionality of what this program does into a function, and I can pass the function some information, and it can give me back information, or I can check that the information is correct without having to do this. So, I'm going to close it down. Now I have to move a little quickly, because I've really wasted a lot of time by waiting for the computer. But um, firstly, I'm going to copy this, copy, paste. I'm going to call my new program IFS2. That's exactly what I wanted to, yes? Uh, that's still IFS. Let's close it. Open up IFS2. Yep, there it is. It actually has this whole old comment in front, which I'll just delete. Uh, I mean, this is a little like stealing code, but it's really just to show you what's going on. I shouldn't be deleting other people's comments. Um, instead of having a main, I want a different function, public, static, void. And what do I call? I get, it's an iterated function system, so I'll just call it iterate. And instead of taking command line arguments, it'll just take this number of trials, copy, paste. And really, it'll still be doing the same thing. Um, all of that. Remove this here. So let's just see what it does. Probability distribution for choosing each rule. Oh, yes. Um, we said that IFS works by having a transformation to a point, but there's more than one transformation. For Sierpinski, for example, there are three, because we can choose any of the three points of the triangle randomly. And what's more is that each possible transformation has a probability attached to it, so that I can either say all three corners are equally likely, or some corners are more likely than others, some transformations are more likely than others. So it's reading the probabilities, good. I'll just say read probability, read props. Okay. Updating the matrices, so that's how to transform CX, at some point how to transform some point Y. It's got these matrices, good. Um, current value of x, y, so it's got some starting point, and in this case, it always starts at 0, 0. Good, I can understand that. Two trials, iterations of the chaos game. So there it does something with standard draw. Here it's got a for loop that repeats trial times. Um, this is good. This is what I think. I'm, I think I know what's going on. It chooses a random number, so it's choosing one of the distributions. It's transforming x and y 
into x0 and y0, the new point, by using cx and cy. I'm mean, not going to discuss how now. And then it says x becomes x0, y becomes y0. So x and y becomes the new point. It's uh, calculated. And finally, almost finally, it draws the point using standard draw. And for efficiency, efficiency, it actually only displays every 100 points. It's not going to display every single point, only every 100 points. Good. And make sure everything gets drawn. It's got a final standard draw that show. It all shows everything is drawn. Um, right. Um, that standard draw also shows everything it's drawn until now. And the pause. Other air conditioning or rain. I hope it's rain. Um, the poll says for the next 10 time units, don't show anything. Okay, that's how it kind of only updates every 100 seconds. So, I want to do exactly the same thing, except I don't want to actually draw it on the screen. So, I'm going to take out all the standard raw stuff. Um, I'm going to kind of keep it, copy it. Paste it down here in main. Good. Yeah, you don't know what's going on, but that's fine. And take it out here. I still need to choose a random uh, transformation, but that's fine. It's not that to do with standard draw. And here it's actually drawing the point and showing every few. Okay. So the only thing that it still does is it draws the point x, y. And that's not how I want iterate to work. So I want iterate to just calculate the points without drawing anything. But it needs to store the points. So I'm going to tell it to make two arrays and store the points inside the arrays. And I'll pass it the arrays. I'll pass it a double x, x array. Array of double xx, array of double yy, and instead of drawing the point, all you do is in xx t you put x, and in yy t you put y. You don't draw anything. So, I'm passing iterate three parameters. One is the number of points I want you to, to calculate, to iterate, using this higher case system. And I'm passing it a parameter where it is uh, an array where it install all the x points, and a second array where y y will install all the y points. So at the moment, iterate has been um, stripped of all communication with standard draw, and I can now actually test it on its own. So I am going to write a new function: public static void draw. And for draw, I'm only going to pass the number of trials. Um, and then it will make an array x, which has that size, and an array y, which has that size, making two arrays of that size. And then it calls iterate with trials and x and y. And at this point, function draw has all the points that need to be drawn because we call iterate to calculate them, but not to draw them. So draw can now use standard draw to do all the drawing. Let's just copy all this code up here. Um, doesn't need to calculate the points. All it needs to do is draw point T, XT, and YT. And then it's happy as well. In fact, if I wanted to separate draw and iterate even more, I can make draw independent of iterate. I give draw a lot of points to draw, and it doesn't know what to draw. It just draws them. Willy nilly. 
So I'm going to change through as well. I'm going to make these two values, I'm going to make them parameters. Um, Don't call iterate. Just draw those points. And then down here, I can write a routine that says, okay, um, X is an array where you store all the X coordinates and Y. First, you iterate trials X, Y. And then you draw X and Y. Need to know how many points. So, I need to... so this code is doing exactly the same as it did before. It will run exactly the same way, I promise you. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to run it once. It's going to complain that it doesn't have a command line parameter. L means it, it's populated in this list. I can go run configurations, IFS2, arguments, the old story about string prompt, run, asking for a value, I'll say 10,000. Um, just for testing purposes, I'm again going to add the Serpinsky triangle. It, again, is going to draw it. And um, everybody will be happy. Except that what I really want to do is to check these two new functions about written. Iterate and draw. To check the they correct. Now, the reason why I separated iterate and draw is because I want to have my functions be independent. If Draw calls iterate, and there's a mistake in iterate, then draw also contains some kind of mistake. Whereas if draw does not call iterate, it works on its own, then I can test it independently. I can write a little function. Oops. I can write a piece of code here in main down here, that calls draw on its own and checks that it works great by giving it the points I want it to plot. So um, this is going to be difficult to see, but instead of all of this, I'm going to comment it out, and I'm just going to call draw with one point, double zero point zero, Double zero point zero. Doesn't like that. Oh. Um, what does it say? Syntax error on tokens. Well, I'll I'll make life easier for all of us. X is zero point zero. Um, let's just do this. Okay, so I'm calling draw, I'm giving it zero, zero, and, and I expect it to plot a point, um, well, in the corner, I might not be able to see that, but let's make it the middle, 5.5 and 0.5. Save it, run it. Still asking for uh, input variable. Why is it doing that? Well, it's not passing anything, but because I had dollar string from, it's always going to give me a box like this. And whatever I type here, it's going to use that to parse whatever it wants to parse from the command line. But the fact is that it doesn't parse anything from the command line. It just draws that single point. So I can just put in here nothing, anything. It's not going to affect it, don't worry. Okay. And now it's going to run. And the only thing it's supposed to do is draw the single point, 0.5.5. 0 
It's taking its time, but eventually it will grow. So draw is a bad kind of function because the only way I can really inject it is to do what I'm doing now, is to give it a point and see that it's plot in the correct place. Yes, it looks like 0.5, looks like roughly the middle. Okay. So draw is a bad function to test, but iterate is a much better function because for iterate, I can give it a very simple transformation. I know it's supposed to take a point zero zero, pick a random transformation, and transform that point. But I can control what's going on. I can control the slide. So if I only give it one transformation to choose from, and my transformation is simple, like add. 0.5 and 0.5 to the point. That is what iterate will do. It will add 0.5 and 0.5 to the point. Okay, I have to stop. Uh, this is all fascinating stuff, but there are a few announcements I have to make. Firstly, remember, no class on Friday. Secondly, uh, I won't be here next Wednesday, but somebody else is teaching. A sample of what future computer transactions, other computer transactions are like. Um, we have to start recursion, it's really important. So, next Wednesday, somebody else, next Wednesday is a Monday. So, somebody else will be teaching that class. I'm back, back next Thursday. Um, we'll be writing a test today. That'll be a test, a practical test on classes, libraries, and functions. So, there'll be questions that ask you to write a small class or to complete a class that does something, or to use a class that you are given. It will be a practical test just like last Thursday. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? Uh, before I leave today, I will put the outstanding things on the web. The um, marking scheme for the project, sample input and output. And I still have a couple of messages that I will answer today on Sunload. Um, I think that's all, for now at least. Okay, thanks guys. I'm gonna put this program on